Obrigada, José Luis. Today, we are going to talk about branding, marketing, and networking. I call this presentation, Don't Be the Best Kept Secret. Make sure that everyone knows about your business and who you are. If you are a secret, then no one can hire you and no one can do business with you. So we will spend some time together this morning helping you make sure that you're no longer a secret and that everyone knows about your organizing business. I like to think of branding, marketing, and networking as three different things. Branding is the heart of your business. So if your business is a body, think of branding as the core. It's the heartbeat of your business. It's why you do what you do. It shows your passion and it shows who you are. Marketing is the skin of your business. It's what you put on when you go out into the world and it's how you showcase your business. Networking can be thought of as the mouth or the voice of the business because it's more personal and it's how you tell people and how you connect with them about what you do. So that's your business in a nutshell, it's a body. It is the heart, it is the skin, and it is your voice and your mouth. Now, let's think of some very famous brands in the world. What is this? Anyone know? She said Macintosh. What else? Apple. So this is the logo, and this is what most people do when they want to go into business. The first thing they do is say, I have to make my logo. I have to hire a graphic designer and have a beautiful logo. What does this logo in particular mean to you? Go ahead and say some things. What does Apple stand for or mean? Innovation, good. Quality, technology. Anything different? Good ideas. New ideas. Marketing. Anyone remember what their slogan was? That wasn't their actual slogan, design, but that's another area of their branding. Their slogan years ago was, think different. Anyone remember that? And when Steve Jobs was alive and was running the company, he had a great ad that said, here's to the crazy ones. Anyone remember that? And the reason why is he said, you need to think crazy to be innovative. Here's another famous brand. Anyone recognize this? Nike. What do they sell? Sportswear? Running shoes? Health, thank you. So they sell athletic wear, but what do they stand for? What does that mean? Speed, very good. The swish is supposed to mean speed and health, and what else? Performance, very nice. Strength. Do you see that for Apple, the logo is the little Macintosh Apple, but the brand, the heart of the business is everything that you said. For Nike, the logo is the swish, and the slogan is just do it. But behind that is a huge brand. Now I want you to think of your business. And we are going to take off your business as if it's a coat that you wore here, and we're going to look at it very carefully today. And when you put it back on, it's going to be better, stronger, and faster than when you came here. Your personal brand is a way of communicating what is inherently you. How many of you have your name in your business name? Raise your hand if you have some version of your name in your business name. Raise them higher. Many of you do, yes. My business name used to be, when I started my business in 2002, it used to be LM Organizing Solutions. Anyone know what the LM stood for? Lisa Montanero, right? <laughs> and then when I closed my residential and business organizing business and started focusing more on productivity 
and success coaching and speaking, I changed the name to Lisa Montanero Global Enterprises. So who is the business? I am. Now some of you might be running a corporate brand. How many of you have a business name that has nothing to do with your name? Raise your hand. So you have very different ways of marketing because you might be marketing the corporation or the business and not yourself. But even if that's true, underneath it all, you still own the business and you're still responsible for the business and you still need to market what you feel about the business. So I want you to be the star of your own life and differentiate yourself. And the way you do that is through what is called the USP. The USP is a unique selling proposition. I don't know how many people are here today, but I know there are many hundreds of you. And as many people of you are in the room, there are different businesses. Each one of you has an individual thumbprint. And because of that, no two of you are alike. I don't want you to ever think of yourselves as competition. You are not competition. There is no such thing as competition because no one is like you. No one has the exact same background as you or expertise. And what I'd like to do in the next slide is go over with you what makes up your USP. So these are all the things that make up a USP. Your education, your background, your former employment. How many of you had a different type of job before you were an organizer? Many of you, yeah. S tell, tell me some of those jobs. What did you do before you opened your organizing business? Teacher, I think I heard science. Lawyer, abogada. Journalism, da dancing, wonderful. Architect administrator. So we have many different backgrounds here. And that already means that you're different than everyone else. Someone with an architect background, if I hired as an organizer to organize my space, I would assume that they have excellent skills in space planning, way more so than someone that did something else in the past. A lawyer like myself has analytical thinking and problem solving skills maybe some counseling as a counselor at law. So every one of you has a different background. Now background is different than your education. Background could be maybe you grew up in a big family, maybe you grew up poor, and that has changed your outlook on how you work with people. So background has to do with your personal life and your family. And then we have, what is your expertise? How many of you have taken many classes in organizing? Do you have a certification? Is anyone here a CPO in America through NAPO? Um, maybe you can get certified here. I know there are several companies that offer certification. What is your personality? Are you energetic and you know, really excited when you do a job or do you come in calm and nurturing? Uh, so that's a different type of personality. Do you have experience working with different types of people? Maybe some of you love to work with senior citizens the elderly, and maybe some of you love to work with students. Hobbies and interests, someone said she's a dancer. Maybe she can incorporate that into her brand. And her packages could be things like, let's tango, and uh, let's twirl around your house. So she could actually incorporate her background into her business if she wanted to. And then what about some volunteer activities? How many of you do some volunteer work? Many of you. You can incorporate that into your business also. So this is your unique selling proposition. And what I'd love for you to do during the conference is write some notes and fill this in and think about what makes me uniquely me and do I bring that into my business? I'll be honest with you, the more you can bring your USP into your business, the better your marketing will be because you will stand out. Now we're going to talk about how to showcase your brand. And there are four components to it. Visual, auditory, print, and then today, online. We can't forget online now. How many of you are online? <laughs> the whole room should uh, raise their hands. This is what goes into the visual components of a brand. Your physical presence, how you look, 
You only have a few seconds to make an impression, and you need to think about what type of impression you want to make. Now, certain things you can't change. I can't change that I'm five foot three with no shoes on. <laughs> I happen to be small. Um, I'm never going to be six foot tall. But there are other things about your physical presence that you can change, like your wardrobe, like what you choose to wear your clothing and your style. When I used to go out and do an assessment, I would dress nicely. But I would tell the client, when I come back here to do the work and to organize your kitchen and your garage, I'm not going to be dressed as nicely as today. I'm going to be in my work clothes. Uh, how many of you do that? You show up for the session looking very different than you did for the assessment. But did I still go to the assessment looking professional? I did. And I had my little clipboard. I always felt better with a clipboard. <laughs> And then your hair and makeup and your personal grooming also make up your visual presence. And then your colors. So I've heard many people say, oh, um, I, I have yellow as my color. My colors for my business are red. How many of you have a color for your business? Many of you. And so that also is part of your branding. The auditory components of your brand are your actual voice and your speaking style. So some people speak very professional. You know, I have a background as a lawyer, and when I used to speak as a lawyer, it's very different. Lawyers tend to be kind of boring, <laughs> and they speak very professionally, and they use big words because they're trying to intimidate people. Um, you don't want to do that as an organizer. You want to connect with people. This is an interesting one, accent. Now, when I give this presentation in uh, the United States, there are many different accents across the United States. I'm sure it's exactly the same here in Brazil, right? So I was having dinner last night with some friends um, here in Sao Paulo, and a few friends joined us from Rio, and they were teasing each other about their different accents between Rio and Sao Paulo. Well, in America, it's exactly the same. Someone from Texas has a really thick Texas accent, uh, whereas I'm from New York originally. New Yorkers have a New York accent. Have you ever heard a New York accent? Um, trying to think of some of the television shows. Have you ever seen The Sopranos? Yo, Tony, that's a, that's a New York accent. You know? <laughs> and I didn't want to show up at a client speaking like a New Yorker uh, because people make assumptions when they hear an accent. So you need to think about all these different things. Another one is your word choice. What words do you use? If you're speaking to a client, you don't want to intimidate them. So you probably don't want to use these long, fancy words. And a lot of organizers will say things like, well, you might be OCD or ACD, but you might have hoarding tendencies. And the client is going, oh, wow, um, there's something wrong with me. So be careful the words that you use. And then the last one we're going to cover a little later in one of my slides. It's called an elevator pitch. Does anyone know what an elevator pitch is? Oh, good, I see some hands. So what is an elevator pitch? Good, a short speech. And who do you give an elevator pitch to? Your prospective clients. So the people that you think may want to hire you. So when we go over an elevator pitch later, that's what it is. And it comes from uh, Silicon Valley in America, in California. You would have a young, um, let's say, group of, group of guys who would want to pitch like Steve Jobs, for example. And they would take an elevator, and they only had enough time during the elevator ride to say what they needed or wanted for their business. And usually it was what? Money. <laughs> That's what they wanted. They wanted money. So the elevator pitch is now a term that people use when they're going to introduce themselves to someone during networking events. These are the print components of your brand. Your business card, your resume, your bio or biography, which is a little short description about yourself and your business. Any books that you've written, any articles, your blog, and your writing style. So some of you are bloggers, and your writing style may be very informal. You say, hey guys, um, I was organizing with a client yesterday, and here's what happened. Or somebody else might write a very formal blog. That has to do with your brand also. Your online presence. How many of you have a website? Raise your hands higher. So 
In this day and age, in the 21st century, if you have a business, you need to have a website. Um, and I know you all know that, so that might be one of the first things you think about doing when you finish up at the conference. I don't know about you, and this may be just me, but when I introduce myself to someone and we're chatting, and they give me their business card, and I say, oh, you have a business, what's your website? That's one of the first things I ask, because I want to go home and Google them. <laughs> I want to research them online. I almost never hire someone that doesn't have a website. So in some ways, you're not going to do well in business if you don't have a website, because people feel like you're not real. You're not a real business. You're not legitimate if you don't have a website. Social media profiles, so that's everything now. Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest. I call it the alphabet soup of social media. Some of you may say, Lisa, I don't have the time to do all of this social media. That's a great thing to hire someone else to do. There are many virtual assistants and social media experts that would love to uh, get your business. So if that's something that you're not good at, you can hire someone else to do that. And then your online publications. If you write articles, you can publish them online. And a professional association like this. This is a professional association. Uh, some people may look you up to see if you're a member. They want to see if you're serious about your business. Do you join your professional association? And then when's the last time you searched yourself? Just put in your name in Google or put in your name in your business and see what comes up. Who's talking about you? Who's talking about your business? I set a Google alert. If you don't know what that is, it's free. You go to google.com and just put in alerts. You could put an alert around your name, put it in quotes, that way it finds your name. You can put an alert around your business name. And you can put an alert around every single blog post or article title. And every time someone mentions it online, you get an alert for free. And it's wonderful because if someone mentions your business on their Facebook page, oh, I hired, you know, Gabriella. And I loved her. She was a great organizer. You might not see that if you don't set a Google alert. So that's another great one. This is how I like to think of branding. Your smile is your logo. Your personality is your business card. And how you leave others feeling after having an experience with you becomes your trademark. So this is really what you want in business. You want people to say, I hired Roberta. And you know, her business card, sure, it's beautiful. It's yellow. It has great branding. But she smiled. She made me feel good. She did a great job organizing. She has a wonderful personality and was easy to work with. She was a lot of fun, actually. And she left me feeling great. This is what you want, right? So I'd like to do a little exercise with you. Has anyone read the book or seen the movie Eat, Pray, Love? Remember it? In the book, they asked uh, the main character, Elizabeth, how many love the book? The book. How many of you love the movie? <laughs> Most people might have seen the movie. The book is better. And the character, Elizabeth Gilbert, travels to three different places in the world. And she comes up with one word to describe each place. Eat for Italy, pray for India, and love for Indonesia. That is her one branding word for each place. It is very difficult. If I asked you to come up with one word for Brazil, could you do it? I don't know. Anyone? Anyone have one word for Brazil? And I'm listening, and they're all different. <laughs> if I had to think of one word for the United States, maybe I would say freedom. Maybe, if I had to think of one word. But it's not easy to do that. If I asked you to come up with one word to describe you, could you do it? It's not easy. So instead, I'm going to give you five. You are allowed to come up with five branding words. And the idea of the five branding words exercise is to actually capture what is uniquely you. And I want you to try to list your five words before you leave the conference. So think about it the next two days. And people ask me, are the words about me or are they about my business? I really want them to be about you. And then you bring those words into your business. But your business can wear those words every day. So I'll give you an example. 
my words are warm, professional, smart, sassy. If you don't know what that is, I'll explain it to you. And now I have to think of the fifth. And uh, productive, because I really do practice what I preach. I walk the walk and talk the talk. And I am extremely organized in my personal life and with my business. So those words come into my business. And everyone that does business with me will say, that's, that's Lisa. That's how I feel after doing business with Lisa. Um, if you can't think of all five of your words, then I would like you to go out and actually ask your best clients. They will give you your words. They're wonderful. Don't ask you know, clients that you don't know well. Um, but ask a few of your favorite clients. Maybe ask some of your close friends. Some, ask some colleagues. Please only ask people that like you. <laughs> Otherwise, you may not like what they say. <laughs> Um, so think about asking others to fill in your words. But if you could try to come up with at least a few of the words yourself, I think it would be great. If you're really stuck, you can go and look at your old job evaluations. What did they say about you? Your old references and letters of recommendation. Um, and you can also um, look at words and phrases that come up a lot when your clients talk about you. Like if a client says, wow, you are such an energizer bunny then like you might say, oh, I'm energetic, you know. Um, or a client might say every time, you are so comforting. So think about what people are saying about you. And then, now that you have this brand and you have these five words and you know how you showcase your brand, you know your colors and your speaking style and how you show up looking and how your online presence looks, once you know all that, now I want you to ask yourself, is my business positioned to take me into the future. Is the business you have right now going to be appropriate one year from now, three years from now, five years from now? Uh, a very famous uh, business coach said this once, and I heard him say it on stage, and I agree with him. He said, the business you start with is never the business you end up with. I will tell you that when I left my law career, after the 9-11 tragedy, I was working in Manhattan, and I used to have a view of the Twin Towers. And there's no better reminder of how short life is and that I wanted to go and do something else than looking out the window and no longer seeing the Twin Towers and knowing what that meant. And so I left and started this business in 2002. And what I wanted to do was change people's lives through organization. And I actually felt that I could make a bigger impact than my law career if I was actually an organizer. And then after some years of being an organizer, I decided that to me personally, it wasn't about the stuff. And I was really not organizing people's things, I was organizing people's brains. Uh, I could go in and change a space, but if they had to then go back and live in it, and they didn't change their behavior, then nothing would change. So I realized that I was more in the business of changing people's behaviors. And so I changed my business. And so my brand is very different than it was in 2002. So think about what your brand will do in the future and how it will change. And I guarantee you that you won't have the exact same brand. You might email me a few years from now and say, Lisa, it's very different than it was then. And that's OK. And so just be willing to change. Anybody familiar with the poet E.E. E. Cummings? Yes? So he is a, a very famous poet, a 20th century poet. And he has a very um, unique signature of writing all of his poems in lower case. He doesn't use any capitals. But I'll be honest, that's not why he's famous. His poetry is really beautiful and uh, very um, poignant, um, very meaningful. And I think this quote sums up branding. He says, to be nobody but yourself in a world which is doing its best night and day to make you everybody else means to fight the hardest battle which any human being can fight and never stop fighting. What he's saying is it is really difficult to stay true to yourself. And many business owners, especially women, fall into the trap which is called the comparison trap syndrome. It means you compare yourself to everyone else. And when you compare yourself to everyone else in this syndrome, you think that you don't measure up. You think that you're not as good as them. You fall into the, I wish I was as good as she is at branding and marketing and networking and I love her website better and she has better clients and, and you need to be careful of this. So every time you start feeling this comparison, 
I want you to go back to your branding and say, what is my USP? What is my unique selling proposition? I love if you look at each other for inspiration and motivation. And if you look at her website and say, wow, that website is beautiful. What can I do in my website to make it better? But don't think that because her website is beautiful or she has clients this week and you don't, that you're not as good as her. So be careful with that. And that's really what E. Cummings is saying, is stay true to yourself and be authentic. People tend to buy from people that they know, like, and trust. In America, we call it KLT, know, like, and trust. If I know you, if I've known you for years, I'm going to trust you more. And let's say I don't know you, but I met you on Facebook. Like, I've met many of you on Facebook. And we've connected, and we've talked, and we've liked each other's posts, and I've been able to see your children, and I know that you like certain singers that I like, and now I feel a connection with you. So I may feel like I like you, and I may even feel like I trust you, even if I don't really know you. And that's why you want to have good marketing. It makes people come in and feel like they know you, like you, and trust you. And that's what you want. So let's move on to marketing. We just finished branding, and that was the heart of the business. That's what you're all about. Marketing is member of the skin. Marketing is how you showcase your brand to the world. Here's what I want you to think of. When you think of marketing, think of the letter C. It is content. So that is what are you putting out there? What are the words on your website? What are your services? What are you offering people? What do you write in your blog posts? When you show up at a client's house, what are you delivering to them? Communication. What are you saying to people? How are you communicating with them? Connection. Are you making a connection with people? Do they feel that they could trust you? And then the last one is consistency. You have to be consistent in marketing. If one day your marketing looks one day, one way, pardon me, and the next day your marketing changes, and the next week you change it again, People aren't sure what you're about. People don't trust people that change their minds often. So if one day your marketing is, we are the experts in this, and the next week it's like, forget that. We're now marketing experts in this. <laughs> people will start to wonder. So think consistency in your marketing. These are the biggest marketing mistakes, and I want you to really pay attention to the first one. The biggest marketing mistakes is confusing marketing with selling. Everyone thinks marketing is selling and they go, well, I don't like to market because I don't like to sell. Forget that. Marketing is not selling. Do you remember what marketing is? Communication, connection, content, consistency. Selling is totally a different area. We will talk about that tomorrow for whoever is coming to my afternoon session, show me the money. So selling is when you start to close the deal. And you say, are you ready to move forward? Are you ready to, to hire an organizer? How about next week? Which package would you like to buy? Do you need to put down a deposit? That's selling. You don't move to selling until you've marketed well and they now know you, like you, and trust you. In fact, the best thing to do is to actually be quiet during a lot of your sales conversations and have them say, you know what, Lisa, I'm ready to do this. Can we start next week? And you go, sure, <laughs> I, have, I have room in my calendar. The second biggest marketing mistake is assuming everyone is going to buy from you. When I ask someone, who would hire you? And they go, everyone, that is the wrong answer. I know you think it's the right answer because you think it's a big world and they're all going to hire me. But you have to have a very specific target market. Otherwise, you are in competition. If everyone's target market here was everyone, you would all be running out the door after the same people. But if your USP is working with certain groups of populations and her USP is different, then you have different target markets. Now you can connect with each other and share ideas and say, oh, I just thought of something for your senior move management company. And she might say, I just thought of something for your organizing for students brand. And it's totally different. Uh, there is a funny song in America. It's um, a country song. You might not remember it because it's pretty old. It's called Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places. I think it's Waylon Jennings. Is that right? And um, that's something you shouldn't do in marketing. So if you know that your target market lives and works in one area, don't go market in the other areas where they're not living, working, or going online. So don't look for clients in the wrong places. 
How do you determine your target market? So these are all the things I want you to think about with your clients. How old are they? What is their age? What is their gender? Do you only organize women? If you do, you're cutting out 50% of the population of the world. Um, I actually enjoy working with men, and I get hired by men a lot as a business coach, as a productivity consultant. So I'm not saying you all have to hire men, but think about it. If almost every woman in the room only works with women and you work with men, you're going to have a lot of clients that they don't have. Um, and you're going to have an entire target market to market to. So that's something to pay attention to. Where do they live? What is their geographic location? So Sao Paulo is a large city. <laughs> so how far will you travel for a client? So that's something to think about. What is their income level? Do poor people have the money to hire professional organizers? Sadly, not always. There may be some programs. You may have a pro bono program where you provide free services certain times of the year. Uh, you may have a scholarship that you grant, and those are two wonderful things to implement. But usually people have to have a little extra income to hire an organizer. What is their education level of your target market? Do they need to have a certain education level? Do you market only to CEOs and professionals? Or can they be someone with a different education level? What is their career? Maybe you target a certain industry. If you used to be a nurse, maybe you target nurses. If you used to be a teacher, maybe you target teachers because they understand you and you understand them. Are they married? Do they have children? A lot of people say, I work with stay-at-home moms. So moms that stay home. Again, that's a wonderful target market, but what about the moms who work and actually need a lot of organizing help at home because they're so busy working? Uh, what about professional women that don't have children? What about professional men that don't have children? So again, really think about who is your target market. And then how do you reach them? Where do they live, work? What do they, where do they go out to dinner? Where do they vacation? What do they read? What websites are they visiting? If you're using social media and you do business organizing, you probably will want to be on LinkedIn but yet you're spending all your time on Instagram. I know it's fun. <laughs> I like Instagram also. Uh, but you need to think about where is your market and how should you actually reach them. So let's think about who is your ideal client. And your ideal client is someone that I want you to paint a picture of in your head. I actually usually have my clients do an exercise where they sit down and write out their ideal client. My ideal client is around this age, they might be married, they might have worked, they might have gone to uni, um, university, they live in a certain area. Um, sometimes, you know, you actually describe them. They're stressed out, they're overwhelmed, they're really good at many things and they can't seem to get organized and it's frustrating them. They're not afraid to ask for help. They hire personal trainers. They hire house cleaning if they need it. Um, they might treat themselves to a massage once a month because they might have extra money. So you want to really think about who is my ideal client. And you might want to write it out. If you don't think about who your ideal client is, they won't appear. So I know it sounds very woo-woo, laws of attraction. Uh, but you want to attract the right people to you. Here's another thing to think about. If someone contacts you and you work with a certain market and they do not fit into that, do not be afraid to say no to business. Everyone is afraid to say no to business. Oh, but Lisa, you know, I took them because I needed the money. And I understand that. But every time you say yes to someone that is not your ideal client, then when your ideal client comes along, you're too busy to take them. And you're filling up your time with all these clients that are actually not a good match for you. The better thing to do is to say, you know what? We're actually not a good match because I don't usually work with whatever the population is, seniors or students, or I don't usually travel over there. But I have a great organizer for you that is a member of an association I belong to that I know, and I'd be happy to refer you to him or her. So turn away that business, and now when your ideal client comes, you are ready to work with them. And also, you now have a colleague who's very happy because you gave them a referral, and they might refer back to you at a time in the future. So what are some great ways to market? So if you're slow in business, and you want to actually get some business going, the best thing to do is to reach out to the clients that you already have. 
Why is that? Why do you want to reach out to the people that have already hired you first? What do you think? Yes, they might hire you again. They already know you, like you, and trust you. So this is what we call your tribe. These are your people. They love you. You know, they'll say, oh, she's a great organizer. And you call them up or you email them, and you say, you know, we, we finished the playroom, but I remember there were some other areas of the house that you said you needed to get organized. And they go, oh, that's true. Why don't you come back and do the living room? Why don't you come back and do the office? So you want to reach out to your existing and your previous clients first. Then you want to reach out to your speaking engagement attendees. So how many of you are going out and doing workshops or presentations? Raise your hands if you're doing any speaking. It doesn't even have to be um, paid speaking, but even just to go out and market your business. Anyone doing speaking? Okay, good. I see some people in the back. Speaking is one of the best ways to market your business. So you go and speak at a local uh, community center or a, a company, a library, um, a senior citizen home, anywhere. And you go out and you give a quick little presentation on some organizing tips and strategies. And the next thing you know, someone in the audience feels a connection with you. And now they want to do business with you. So you want to reach out to them. You want to reach out to your prospects, all the people that have contacted you in the past. I know some organizers who are disorganized. Does that surprise you? How many of you are actually a little disorganized yourself? But it's, you can organize other people and still be disorganized. Um, some people are afraid to admit that, but I know a lot of organizers in America who will say, oh, I'm totally disorganized. I'm able to go out and organize other people, but I've got prospects sitting in my email that I haven't replied to. And I have people that have called me for the last few weeks to hire me, and I haven't called them back yet. So be careful if you're not marketing by contacting those prospects. What do you do if you go to hire someone and they don't call you back? You go on to the next person. Yeah. If I try to hire someone and I say, hi, you know, I would like to hire you. Give me a call back. And I don't hear back from them in a few days. I don't think they're a good business owner and I move on to someone else. So I'm going to show you two slides. One is called online tools and one is called offline tools. Online are all of the ways that you can market on the internet. Offline tools are the traditional ways of marketing when you're actually with a person. And I want you to look at these marketing options and be strategic. I don't want you to look at the next two slides and think that you have to do everything on it. You will fall down <laughs> and be very tired and you will hate your business. So do not think that you have to do everything. Decide what's the best fit for you and then only do those things. So here is the online marketing tools. And you'll see now why I don't want you to think you have to do everything because there's a lot on there. So pick and choose which ones are the right for you. So go ahead and just yell out one or two things that you're going to do that you're not doing yet. Teleclasses, good. What else? Which one? The last one, Google Alerts, good. Obrigada. What else? Anyone going to do anything else on that list? Good. The, there is a lot here. Honestly, you could do these for the next five years. That's how long it could take you. So think of what will I do a few months after the conference. Maybe I'll set a Google alert. Maybe I'll set my first teleclass. Maybe I'll do my first workshop. Somebody else, maybe you pick something a year from now, two years from now. I don't want you to think you have to do all of this tomorrow. These are the offline marketing tools. And I'll be honest that everyone is so obsessed with the internet, which is wonderful that a lot of people aren't marketing anymore face to face. They're not doing what we call traditional marketing. And so if you're the only one marketing in your neighborhood, if you hang up your business cards and flyers and postcards at the local coffee shop on the bulletin board, and you're the only organizer there, and I go get coffee there every day after I've looked at my kids, let's say playroom, <laughs> and I see your card, I might want to hire you. So this is actually a good way to market, and a lot of people are ignoring this. Uh, 
So think about that also. These are all great ways to market. The last one says media. So you can write a column for a newspaper. Uh, you can try to write for a magazine. If you have a local radio station, you can try to get on a local radio station. It's not always easy to do media, but you can do it. I've done all three of those, radio, newspaper, and magazines. And it's a lot of fun, but everyone thinks it brings you a lot of business. It brings you a lot of exposure, but sometimes it doesn't bring you business because people assume, oh, she's on TV. Oh, she's in the newspaper. She doesn't have time to go out and actually work with people anymore. So sometimes it's not the best marketing, even though you think it is. It's fun, and it gets your name out there, and it can raise your fees, um, and you might get more speaking, but it's not always the easiest marketing. This is a marketing funnel. It is an upside-down pyramid, and this is how marketing works. The prospects, the people that could hire you, prospective clients, enter your community. So how do they enter your community? Maybe they get your newsletter for free. Maybe they read your blog. Maybe they come hear you speak at the community center or the church. Then, maybe in the future they buy from you. It could be a year later. Roberta, I now need an organizer. I didn't need one when I met you last year. Now they buy from you. What do they become now? What's their name now that they bought from you? Client. So that's called client conversion. You convert them to a client. After that, they become raving fans. They love you. Once they become raving fans, that's when you become successful. What do people do when they're a big fan of yours? They share. <laughs> they talk about you. So they tell everyone. Word of mouth is one of the best forms of marketing. And now that they tell everyone about you and they write about you on social media, and they tell all their friends to hire you, you have a lot more business. So this marketing funnel is really important. You want to move people down the funnel. So we've talked about branding. Remember, that's the heart. Marketing is the skin that you wear. And now networking is how you develop relationships with people on a more personal level, one-on-one. -on -one. Usually when you market, you're speaking to many. So think of marketing as one to many. I want you to think of networking as one-to-one. -one. So networking, usually I go to a networking event. Could be this one, it could be any networking event. And usually you're speaking to one person at a time. So it's much more personal. By the way, can you network, it? Can you network at events that are not business? Yeah, where else can you network? At the gym, anyone go to the gym? <laughs> I see people doing business on the elliptical. So what do you do? You know? <laughs> You can network at parties, cocktail parties. You have a subway. That's a great one, actually. I love it. She's hanging on the subway. So what do you do? <laughs> Shopping? Yeah, I love it. So you're like picking out a handbag. <laughs> she starts to talk when she's shopping. She might say, oh, I'm picking out this yellow handbag. Those are the colors of my business. And someone says, what do you do? Um, I know an organizer that um, has signs on her car, and the signs on her car say, you know, get organized, and she goes to get out of her car at the shopping center, and people always come over and go, can I have a card? I need you. Um, people, people network everywhere. So, and I'm not saying to be annoying and talk about your business all the time, but you don't want to just limit your networking to official business events. So this is the dreaded question. Now, how many of you hate when people ask you, so what do you do? How many of you, the minute someone asks you that, you clam up and you don't want to talk? Anyone afraid of this question? No? Good. Anyone? Be honest. So what I'm going to do is help you before we finish. We do have a little time left. And I'm going to help you come up with this elevator pitch, which means that Anytime you go to any networking event, you know what to say. But I'm going to give you one rule. You are not allowed to say your title. What do I mean by that? Usually when people say, so what do you do? The typical response is, I am a blank. Fill in the blank. What do people say? I am a lawyer. Now, why do you not want to say your title? If I said to you, if I met you at a networking event, and I said, I am a lawyer, what would you think of? You remember, you don't know me yet. You don't know that I'm warm, professional, sassy, productive, and smart. You only know all the other lawyers that you've ever met. 
What if you don't like lawyers? A lot of people don't, sadly. Well, maybe it's not like that here. Maybe, it, maybe here lawyers are respected, but in America sometimes there are some lawyers that are what we call bad apples. They're not always, not always good people. Um, what if you said, I am a professional organizer? So what happens when you say, I am a professional organizer? There are so many things wrong with that, but let's talk about the first one. What's the first thing wrong with that? You think of what you think a professional organizer is. So what if I say, I meet you at an event and I say, oh, I'm a professional organizer, and the person I'm speaking to says, oh, you organize closets? And what if I've never touched a closet in my entire organizing career? What if I don't do any residential organizing whatsoever? What if I only work with businesses and productivity? Or what if you say I'm a professional organizer and the person goes, what's that? Because many people still don't know what it is. So the better thing to do is to not say I am a blank. The better thing to do is to actually say what you do, who you do it for, and the benefits or results achieved by the work that you do with these people. And I'll give you an example in a moment. But it's an expression of who you are and what makes you stand out and why people and organizations will want to do business with you. It should get people's attention. So I'm going to ask each one of you to come up with your individual elevator pitch. And I'd like you to practice it at this conference with each other so by the time you go home, you will actually have it written out. And that way you can practice it a little. So the next time you go to one of these events or you meet someone shopping, you won't stop and say, I'm a professional organizer. Do you know what that is? <laughs> Which is probably not the best response. So here's an example. I work with, and then fill in the target market. So let's say I work with busy professionals to help them become more organized and productive so that they can, and then what's the transformational experience? So that they can what? Enjoy their lives, be on time, not yell at their kids anymore. What is the transformational experience? So we can do this example. This is called a positioning statement. This is a sample elevator pitch. And you can fill it in for yourself. I work with, who do you work with? What's your target market? So the first thing you fill it in with is your target market or your ideal client. And remember, it may not be the same for all of you. Then you want to say, what do you do for them? I help them organize their home. I help them declutter. I help them set up systems. I help them move. I help them improve their home life so that they can what? Get more time in their day, spend more time with their family, be less stressed, enjoy their life more. If you work in business organizing, maybe help them get promoted, help them not get fired. So think, how would you fill this in? Does anyone wanna try theirs as an example? I can do it with you. So raise your hand if you wanna be my volunteer and you just tell me what you do and I'll fill it in for you. Is that a hand? Do I have a volunteer? See? Si? Obrigada. Nice to meet you. Okay, so uh, what is your name? Alison. Alison or Alison? Alison. Obrigada. So, Allison, I work with, who do you work with? See, si. I don't know what she said, but I'm sure you do. <laughs> I love it. To help them, what do you help them do? Okay. Okay, good. Ah. Hola. <laughs> Hola. Okay, so let's begin again. Comments. Uh, I work with? Otimização do tempo. And who do you work with? Para que eles possam usar o tempo deles com o que eles mais gostam de fazer, com a família, é, atividades físicas. To help them, 
What do you help them do? Ajudá-los a se organizar no dia a dia, a ter maior qualidade e tempo com o que eles gostam. Ok, I understood that. You can... <laughs> so that they can, so that they can. What's the experience, the results, or the benefits of the work that you do? What do you want them to experience at the end? É, um controle maior sobre a vida deles, né? E a qualidade do tempo deles com que eles para que eles façam o que eles gostem de fazer. Good, good. Bom, and if you met me at a networking event and I asked you what do you do, would you feel comfortable saying that to me? Eu transformo vidas. Good, wonderful. Okay. <laughs> bravo, bravo. Thank you. <laughs> Obrigada. So I want all of you to actually come up with your elevator pitch and practice it here with each other. So every time you meet someone here that you don't know well, I want you to say, so, you know, what is your name? Nice to meet you. So what do you do? And then give the person a moment to remember, I work with. Now somebody asked me, Lisa, can I change it? Can I say, I help? I help and then put in the target market. You can, but If you start with, I work with, and you say the people first, then you can say to help them. So you're still getting the word help in there, so I think it might be good to actually say, I work with first. So I'll give you an example. For me, I would say, I work with entrepreneurs, business owners, to help them build their business so that they can be profitable and successful, short and sweet. The shorter, the better, because what you want them to do is then say, Oh, tell me more. The best elevator pitches actually make other people want to keep talking to you. And so the idea is not to speak too long, like she did nice and short, and that way you then can say, so what do you do? And you can have a two-way conversation. I want you to think of good networking like playing tennis. Good networking is I serve the ball, and you catch the ball, well actually hopefully you don't catch it, uh, and then you serve the ball back like ping pong. So you want to have what's called a ping pong or tennis conversation with someone. If you find yourself that you're doing all the talking, what may happen? The, yes, you may lose the other person, they may get bored. And how can you tell if someone's bored at a networking event? If they're talking to you and we're supposed to be having a conversation and they're like, uh-huh, They're looking for someone else to talk to. Or if he's explaining, I'm going, uh-huh, what does that mean? I don't understand, right? I don't understand. So sometimes you have to explain a little more of what you do, and that's fine. Don't worry too much. If you want to find a buddy at the conference, um, I call it an elevator pitch buddy, and find a friend and practice with him or her. And some people ask me, Lisa, should I write it down? I think you should. And you can have several different elevator pitches. So if you work with different target markets, like if you do residential organizing, you might say one elevator pitch. And if you do business organizing, you might say a different elevator pitch. It is okay to have more than one networking statement. It's perfectly fine. But if you only have 25 seconds, which is really the average time you have to say what you do, which is very short, if you only have 25 seconds, you may want to combine them into one statement. So let's say that you do residential organizing and business organizing. One of the best things to do is say, hello, my name is Lisa Montanaro, and I own a business called Lisa Montanaro Global Enterprises, and I help busy professionals organize their homes and their businesses so that they can be more successful and peaceful and less stressed. So you can easily combine it. People always say to me, I do homes and offices, but they seem so disconnected. People that work in offices, do they have homes? Yes. So everyone in an office, if you go do, a, let's say, a presentation in an office environment, every one of them has to go back to the house they live in, and maybe it's just as disorganized or worse than it is at work. In fact, What do the studies show? Are people more disorganized at home or at work? Casa, at home. Why? Por qué? Why? 
what, do you get paid at home or at work? You get paid at work. At work, you have a boss, usually, and you have people depending on you, and you go there every day, and you have to do your job. If you, if you don't do your job, if you say, ah, it's disorganized, but find it somewhere, <laughs> you might not be very popular at work. You go home, you're tired, you're hungry, your family's depending on you, no one's paying you. So a lot of people come home and they throw their stuff and they are more disorganized. So people go, well, because everyone's more disorganized at home, I only do residential organizing. I'd like you to raise your hand if you do home or residential organizing. Raise your hand. And now raise your hand, good. Okay, a lot of you, many. Now raise your hand if you do business organizing. Okay, good, there's many of you. I'm happy to see that because people are disorganized in both places. Anybody ever see the movie Wizard of Oz? Yes. So Judy Garland played Dorothy. She sings that beautiful song, Over the Rainbow. She has a beautiful quote. It says, always be a first-rate version of yourself instead of a second-rate version of somebody else. So if you, if you want to think about the theme for this morning, I want you to think that be yourself, because an original is better than a copy every time. People want to do business with you. Remember how you are unique. Differentiate yourself. Don't feel that you have to be just like everyone else. I want you to do three exercises for me during the conference. What is your unique selling proposition? What are your five branding words? And what is your elevator pitch, your positioning statement? If you can do those three exercises before you leave the conference or right after you get back home, you will have branding, marketing, and networking done. And you will feel really good and then I want you to take all of that and go out and showcase your brand so that you and your business are not a secret and everyone knows who you are. If you'd like to stay in touch with me, this is how you can reach me. If you pretty much put in Lisa Montanero on social media, you'll find me. <laughs> and I will be here for the rest of the conference at the Expo and I would love to meet you. And if you want to come and practice with me and tell me your five words or your elevator pitch, I'd be happy to hear from you. And for those of you that are going to be here tomorrow afternoon, I look forward to seeing you at my next presentation at 4.30. Obrigada.